ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was by far one of the most extraordinary and prolific teachers this world has ever seen. He used a multitude of techniques to teach and to convey the core concepts of this religion to the believers and and this includes the exemplification of his message in his character. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was asked about the character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said كان خلقه القران that his character was the quran one of the most effective measures the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to educate this ummah was through the use of stories قصص stories that have lessons in them as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لكل الالباب that indeed in their stories mean in the stories of the prophets and messengers in the quran عبرة لكل الالباب they are not for entertainment purposes but they have lessons in them for people of understanding for men of intelligence there are lessons in these stories and through the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he narrated many stories all of which contain valuable lessons related to our aqaid related to our beliefs and general knowledge regarding life which has the propensity to refine the character and the behavior of the believer who reads the stories for that purpose one of the most profound stories that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam related to this ummah was that of a young devout worshiper from bani israil who was tested with the like of which would have shaken the faith of the strongest believer from amongst us it was mentioned in sahih al-bukhari and muslim on the authority of abu huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qala qala nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam lam yatakallam fi al-mahdi illa thalathah عيسى بن مريم وصاحب جريج وكان جريج رجلا عابدا يعني من بني اسرائيل فاتخذ سمعة فكان فيها فاتته امه وهو يصلي فقالت يا جريج فقال جريج يا ربي امي وصلاتي امي وصلاتي فاقبل على صلاته فانصرفت فلما فلما كان من الغد اتته مره ثانيه وهو يصلي فقالت يا جريج فقال جريج يا ربي امي وصلاتي فاقبل على صلاته فانصرفت فاتته امه اليوم التالي مره ثالثه فقالت يا جريج فقال جريج يا ربي امي وصلاتي فاقبل على صلاته فقالت امه اللهم لا تمته حتى ينظر في وجوه المومسات the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that none spoke in the cradle except three jesus the son of maryam and the companion of juraij he said that juraij was a devout worshiper from bani israil who had a monastery that he secluded himself in and devoted himself to worship so while he was praying his mother came to him as she called him ya juraij and Juraj as he continued his prayer conflicted he said oh allah should i respond to my mother or should i continue praying fa aqbala ala salati so he continued praying and his mother left 
His mother came to him for a second time the next day and she called him Ya Juraj. And Juraj conflicted about whether he should respond to his mother or should he continue his prayer. And so he continued his prayer and his mother left. His mother came to him for the third time the very next day and she called him Ya Juraj. Juraj conflicted again and he said, Oh Allah, should I continue my prayer or respond to my mother? And he continued his prayer. And his mother said, Oh Allah, do not allow my son to die until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. The first thing that we want to look at in this hadith is the fact that Juraj isolated, isolated himself from the general populace and devoted himself to worship in his monastery. And while this was permissible in the Sharia of Bani Israel, it is not permissible or admissible in Islam. As a scholar say, that the human being is a communal creature by nature. That we intermingle and we interact with people because that is part of our social development. And in Islam, it is not permissible for us to isolate ourselves from the general body of the Muslims and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in an authentic hadith, Al-Mu'min al-Ladhi yukhalitu al-Nas wa yasbir ala adahum khayrun min al-Mu'min al-Ladhi la yukhalitu al-Nas wa la yasbir ala adahum that the believer that mixes with the people and is patient with the harm that he receives from people because of our different social environments, because of our different social statuses, because of our different experiences, because of our different upbringings, when you lump all of these people together solely based upon faith, there's going to be problems. We're not going to see the world the same way. We're not going to see life the same way. So there's going to be problems. But the believer that mixes with the people and is patient with the harm that he receives from people is better for the better than the believer who does not mix with people and is not patient with the harm that he receives from people. But we live in a time of convenient tolerance. Meaning we tolerate things that are convenient for us and we don't tolerate things that are not convenient for us. When we go to work and we intermingle with non-Muslims, we tolerate, you know, the hip, the, we tolerate whatever ridicule that comes to us at our jobs. We tolerate whatever humiliation comes to us by way of the hierarchy of our jobs from our bosses or people that are above us. But when we come to the masjid, we're not tolerating any harm from any Muslim. So we have convenient tolerance. The Prophet وسلم, said to the Sahaba when they came to him to complain about the torture and the persecution they were receiving from Quraysh. The Prophet وسلم, said that there was a time when a man would be buried up to his neck in dirt and a hot comb would be taken and put over the skin of the individual that would peel his skin away from his bones. He said that this would not be enough to turn him away from his belief, his religion, but you people are too hasty. You don't have any tolerance. And this is the issue that we're dealing with today amongst one another. <laughs> Except in the case of extreme fitna, where mixing with people becomes more detrimental to your deen than mixing with them. As the Prophet ﷺ said, You shiku an yakuna khayra mal al rajul. The Prophet said that there will come a time when the best property or the best merchandise that the believer has is his ghanam, is his sheep that he takes with him into the deep valleys of the mountain, running away with his deen from fitna. This is the only time that it is admissible for us to run with our religion and to isolate ourselves from the general body of the Muslims. So his mother came to him while he was praying on three occasions. And while he was conflicted, he continued to pray, ignoring the call of his mother. Just think about your mother who gave birth to you after the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calls you on three instances, and you ignore her call. And although Juraj was in salah, as the scholars explain that it was more appropriate for him to respond to his mother than to ignore. And it shows us that a good intention, if it is not coupled with knowledge, can do more harm to you than it does benefit. Because we always say, well, my intentions was good. My intentions were pure. But your actions were contradictory to the religion. As a Allah, he said, لم يبلغه. How 
how often time, how often does a person intend to do good, but because of his lack of knowledge, but because of his lack of direction, he fails to do it. You intend it well, but you fail to do it because you lack the knowledge, you lack the know-how, you lack the wherewithal to uh, achieve that good. And the scholars, they say, كَانَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ النَّفَلِ وَكَانَ يَنْبَغِ لَهُ أَنْ يُجِيبَ أُمَّهُ لِأَنَّ إِجَابَةَ الْوَالِدِ فِي مِثْلَ هَذِ الْحَالِ فَارَضٌ That Juraid, he was praying a supererogatory prayer, a surah prayer, a prayer that was not obligatory on him. And in this state, it becomes obligatory upon you to respond to your mother because responding to your mother is wajib and the sunnah prayer is sunnah and we don't give precedence to something that is sunnah over something that is wajib. And the same applies to a woman who wants to fast, a supererogatory fast, like Mondays or Thursdays or three days out of the month. And she does so without the permission of her husband. The right of your husband, the sexual needs of your husband, come before your supererogatory fast. And as Salman al Farisi said to Abu Darda, إِنَّ لِرَبِّكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ وَإِنَّ لِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ وَإِنَّ لِزَوْجَتِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّ فَأَعْطِ كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقَّهُ That indeed your Lord has a right over you, your body has a right over you, your wife has a right over you, so give everyone that has a right their rights. But we don't ignore the rights of other human beings at the expense of Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Islam, we have what is fadl, what is obligatory, and we have what is sunnah. And it's imperative that we are able to make a distinction between the two. وَأَنَّ الْوَالِدَيْنِ إِذَا نَادِيَاكَ وَأَنْتَ تُصَلِّ فَإِنَّ الْوَاجِبْ إِجَابَتَهُمَا لَكِنْ بِشَرْتْ أَنْ لَا تَكُونَ الصَّلَاةِ فَرِيضًا فَإِنْ كَانَتْ فَرِيضًا فَلَا يَجْرُزُ أَنْ تَجِيبَهُمَا لَكِنْ إِذَا كَانَتْ نَافِلَ فَأَجِبْهُمَا Shaykh Saleh al-Uthameen rahimahullah ta'ala in this explanation of this hadith, he said that it is incumbent, it is an obligation upon you when your parents call you to respond to your parents. Except that if you are praying an obligatory prayer, if you are praying an obligatory prayer, then it becomes an obligation upon you to complete your prayer and not respond to your parents. But if you are praying a, a supererogatory prayer, a sunnah prayer in your room, in your living room, and your mother calls you, you are to break your prayer, stop your prayer, and respond to your parents. <clears throat> and this is out of the great and tremendous respect that Islam has given to the parents. More importantly, the mother, who the Prophet ﷺ said three times, if there was anyone who was more deserving of your companionship, anyone that is more deserving of your respect, anyone that is more deserving of your love and your compassion and your reverence is your mother. And parents need to be cautious because the other issue in this hadith is his mother got so upset with him not responding, she made dua against her own son. She said, Allahumma la tumithu hatta yandhura fi wuju al mumisat. Oh Allah, do not allow him to die until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. Parents need to be cautious about this. Because sometimes mothers will make dua against their children out of resentment for the father. For the father of the child, you resent the father of the child and you begin to make dua against your children. Saying things like you're going to end up just like your father. Saying things like your father is no good and you're going to end up or just like your father. Why would you say this to your child? Knowing that the Prophet said, مستجابات لا شك فيهن دعوت المظلوم ودعوت المسافر ودعوت الوالد لوالده وفي نوايت أن الدعوت لوالد على والده. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that three three supplications that will always be responded to. لا شك في هنا and there's no doubt about that. And that's the dua of the traveling person. So as long as you are traveling for something that is halal, if you are traveling for something that is halal, stop in the shout. Talking to show the sabab, then you are missing a, a condition of traveling. Because if we travel, we travel for what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for something that is halal. How do you get on a plane? How do you get on a train or automobile? And you head out to your destination making dua, hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to your dua while you're traveling. But you're traveling for something that is halal and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asha wa kandam. The dua of the traveling person. The du'a of the oppressed. And the du'a of the oppressed will only be responded if you haven't oppressed somebody else. How do you oppress someone and then when someone oppresses you, you may raise your hands to make du'a and you are a person
person that is guilty of oppression yourself. The dua of the oppressor, the oppressor will not be responded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my dua, or kafirin na illa fi dalal. That the supplication of the non Muslims, those who are oppressive, fi dalal, it will not be responded to. How do you oppress someone and then when that oppression comes back to you, you may raise your hands and make dua? It's not going to be responded to. So as long as you are not an oppressor yourself, the dua of the traveler, the dua of the oppressed person, and the dua of the parent for the child, and in another narration, the dua of the parent against the child. Inshallah ta'ala, please move up to make room for uh, people that are coming in, inshallah ta'ala. So the parent needs to be cautious about making dua against your child. And as a matter of fact, we should do the opposite, and that is to make dua for our children. When your children get on your nerve, as they will, use your anger, hone in on your anger, and use that for positive. Use it for positive. When your child frustrates you to the point that you want to hit them, you say, Oh Allah, guide this child. Oh Allah, have mercy on this child. Oh Allah, make this child better. You use your anger, you use that energy for what is positive that will turn out and show up to Allah for the favor and the favor of the child. But the mother, she made dua against Juraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow him to die until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. And in Islam, we have been commanded not to allow our anger to control us. We have been commanded to protect our children. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and idols. Not to make dua against your child. And she made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow him to die until at first he looks into the faces of prostitutes. If tutina wa li anna nadhar rajul ila mar'a fitnatun فَكَيْفَ إِذَا كَانَتْ زَانِيَ بَغِيَّةً فَأَشَدُّ فِتْنَةً The scholars, they explain that if a man looks into the face of a, of, a, of, a, of a fornicator, looks at the faces of fornicators, and we're all guilty of this if we entertain the American media and the movies and the, 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 the things that they put out for the public to look at, most of which people are not married, people are engaging in, Premarital or postmarital relations that have absolutely nothing to do with our need. So all of us play a part in that. But if you look into the face of someone who is an adulterer or a fornicator, you test yourself, you test your deen, you test your iman. He said, because looking at a woman is a fitna for you, so how much more would it be to look at a woman who was engaging in, in pr promiscuity and in, in engaging in seductive behavior? Rather, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made detestable to the hearts of the believers. As Allah says in the Quran, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَحْبَبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي كُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَبْرَهَا إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُصُقَ وَالْإِسْءُ وَالْإِسْيَانِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made iman, faith, beloved to the heart of the believer. And he has made kufr, disbelief, fusuk, evil deeds, and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detestable to the heart of the believer. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala One day he went to his scholar, his shaykh, Waqi' ibn Jarrah, Abu Malih, and he went to him to complain about his bad memory. And Imam al-Shafi'i was someone who was given, Sari al was given the ability to memorize very quickly, so much so that when he opened the book that had two flaps, he would cover the left side of the, the right side of the page so that he could only memorize one page at a time because if his eye landed on it, he would memorize it. But one day his memory began to dwindle and he wanted to know why. So he went to a shake and he said to him that I, I, my memory is leaving me, what is the problem? And his shake told him, perhaps you committed a sin because that is the only thing that interferes with your memory. Your memorization of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your memorization of knowledge, there's nothing that will help that except obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fattakullah yu'alimukumullah. Fear Allah and Allah will teach you. Allah will give you the faculties that you need to learn your deen. So Imam al 
Meshach, he began to think about all of the sins that he committed. And he remembered that he walked out of the masjid one day. His, he remembered that when he walked out of the masjid one day, his eye fell on the feet of a woman. Not intentionally, but just a woman walking in front of him. And his eyes landed on her feet. And it was because of that he lost his memory. And he made a, he made a line of poetry that is famous among students of knowledge. Shekotu ila wati in sua hibdi fa anashadani ila tarakin ma'asi fa inna ilma nur Allahi wa nur Allahi wa la yuta li'asi that I complained to Wakir about my bad memory. So he directed me to leave off disobedience because indeed knowledge is the light of Allah and Allah does not give his light to those who are disobedient. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyyaku bima ja'a fihi min al-ayati wa dhikri al-hakim aqumu ma tasma'un astaghfirullah hadhi wa lakum wa isa'id al-mu'minin min kulli dham fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. الحمد لله العلي الجبار غافر الذنب وقابل التوب الشديد العقاب وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. The scholars they also explain أن فيه دليل على أن الشفقة التي أودعها الله في الوالدين قد يوجد ما يرفع هذه الشفقة لأن هذه الدعوة من هذه المرأة عظيمة. That also the scholars they explain that from this hadith shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in our parents shafaqa, compassion and mercy for the children. However, that compassion and that mercy, it is possible that we may do something that may take that compassion and mercy away from them. Just as it was in the case of Juraj. That his mother, her anger reached to such a degree that she forgot about the compassion and the mercy that she normally had for her child. And as it's a well-known saying that we have in the English language, don't ever think that something is so beautiful that in certain circumstances and situations it won't appear ugly. فأمكنته من نفسها فوقع عليها فحملت فلما ولدت قالت هو من جريج. That a prostitute, she went to some of the people of Bani Israel. Bani Israel, they begin to talk about جريج. That جريج thinks that his worship is better than everyone else's. Look at how the hasad, look at how the envy settles in. And this is why the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said استعينوا استعينوا that seek assistance with the success of your affairs by hiding them. But we live in a time where we want to let everybody know where we're going on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm going here. I'm on my workflow. I'm on my hot flow. I'm on my fudger flow. You want everybody to know what you're doing, not knowing that you are inviting jealousy and envy into your life unnecessarily. Everybody don't need to know what every move you're making. استعينوا بإنجاح نحوائجكم بكتمان Seek assistance with the success of your affairs by hiding them As Imam Ahmed رحمه الله تعالى He said السلام أن تحب أن لا تواف That safety and security is in loving not to be known Not wanting people to know your business But we live in a time today where we want everybody to know our business We wonder why our communities are so fragmented we wonder why shaitan flows through us like blood. Ripping our communities apart. Ripping our families apart. Ripping our children apart. Separating them from their deen. Because we don't know how to follow the injunctions that have been given to us in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now many Israel, they begin to talk about your age. And so, the prostitute came to them and said, If you want, I'll go test your age for you. Make no mistake about it. There's always someone waiting to prove that you are not who you say you are. <coughs> There's always someone lurking, waiting to prove, to prove to the world that you are not who you say you are. She said, I'll go test your age for you if you want. 
So she went to Juraj and she offered herself to him. Juraj never even looked at the woman. And that's the case of a man who has Iman, faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He worships Allah as if he can see him. And even though he knows that Allah can't, that he can't see Allah, he knows full well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him. Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in the room alone with the woman, that she was alone in the room with the woman and she desired him. He was young and all of the elements that is necessary for a situation of zina were prevalent. However, he refused to acquiesce. He refused to submit. He said, I can't do this. Your husband raised me. Do we operate with that level of faith today? Do we operate with that level of iman today? When we will refuse to engage in something that is haram because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. Yusuf alayhi salam, he said, Rabbi sijinu wa haqqu ilayya mimma yadirunani ilayya. We'll go to jail for the stupidest things. Yusuf said, I would rather be in prison than commit zina. I would rather go to jail. Prison is more beloved to me than the zina that they call me to. And so Juraj, he never even looked at the woman. So when she couldn't get Juraj to be intimate with her, she found a lie, she found a, a goat herder who used to clean the monastery of Juraj. And he, she allowed him to have relations with her. And she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to the child, she lied and said the child belongs to Juraj. And this is the plot of Shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned to us that Shaitan is our enemy. فَاتَّخِذُوا who aduwa Take him as an enemy. But instead we take one another as an enemy when the Shaitan is free to roam in our communities, free to roam in our families, free to roam in our brotherhood and our sisterhood of Islam. While we take one another as enemies, the Shaitan is free to roam and create mischief. So when the woman gave birth to the child, she said that the child belongs to Juraj, lied on Juraj. And the scholars, they explain that this shows that when a person doesn't like you, they will find every reason to lie on you. They don't, they don't need a reason to lie on you. But any tidbit of information that they can have that would justify how they feel about you, they will use it. As the scholars, they have a line of poetry that goes with this. That when a person loves you or a person is pleased with you, they don't see no wrong that you do. But when a person doesn't like you, they see everything that you do to be wrong. Everything you do is wrong. Nothing you do is right. And that's because the eye of sakh, because the eye of hatred, the eye of hatred sees all of your flaws. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to get the facts. When she brought the child to Bani Israel and said the child belongs to Juraj, they never went and verified anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayu aladina amnu and ja'akum fasikum bi nabayin fatabayinu. Oh, you will believe when a facet, when a sinful, rebellious individual brings you news, verify it. We don't verify anything. Somebody comes to us and says, such and such said this, or such and such did that. We just accept it. No verification, no nothing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, that you harm people in ignorance, and then afterwards you're regretful. Afterwards, I'm sorry. Afterwards, I apologize. After you have destroyed the person's honor, after you've destroyed the person's dignity, now I'm sorry. But if we would have followed the guidelines that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in the Qur'an, we could have avoided that. There was a story that was mentioned about Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, one of the imams, one of the leaders of the believers in the past. Kana jalisan in the zuhri. He was sitting with one of the scholars, well-known scholars of hadith by the name of Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. فَجَاءَهُ رَجُلٌ فَقَالَ فَقَالَ لَهُ Sulaiman بَلَغَنِي أَنَّكَ وَقَعْتَ فِيَّا وَقُلْتَ كَذَا وَكَذَا فَقَالَ الرَّجَلُ مَا فَعَلْتُ وَمَا قُلْتُ فَقَالَ السُّلَيْمَانِ إِنَّ الَّذِي أَخْبَرَنِي صَادِقٌ فَقَالَ الزُّهْرِ لَا يَكُونُ النَّمَّانِ صَادِقًا 
وقال سليمان صدقت وقال للرجل اذهب بالسلام that Suleyman ibn Abdul Malik he was sitting with Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri and when a man approached Suleyman said to him it reached me that you said this and this about me and the man says to Suleyman I didn't say it and I didn't do it so Suleyman said yeah you did it as one of these it a truthful person a reliable trustworthy person told me you said it and Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri turned to him and said that a person who is an imam, a person who tell carries between this one and this one can never be trustworthy. How you deem him to be trustworthy? And the fact that he brought you the information, he brought it to you on sin and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can he be trustworthy? Suleyman said, you know what? You're absolutely right. He told the man, it had the salam, go in peace. You are the man. You tell Carrie. You go to this one and say, guess what such and such said about you. Oh, then you go to this one and say, guess what such and such said about you. And then we'll confront someone based upon that and say, such and such told me, but such and such told you based upon sin and disobedience. So how could you trust anything that someone who is disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? So when Bani Israel found out they went to Juraj, they destroyed his monastery, they dragged him out of his place of worship, Juraj not even knowing what was going on, asked them, why are you doing this to me? They said, because you committed zina with this prostitute and she has your child. Juraj said, Inti the Sabi, bring the child to me. And then Juraj told them, Da'udi usalli rakate. Let me pray to Raka. Just leave me and let me pray. Look at how he relied on the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wasta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Seek assistance and patience in prayer. While when we go through difficulty, we run away from the prayer. You see a brother has been absent in the masjid. Where you been, Ashi? I haven't seen you. I'm concerned about you. Oh, I'm going through something. We all going through something. Do you believe that the something you are going through is going to get better when you stop praying? You leave off of the salat, is your life going to get better? He said, Da'uni will tell you what I tell you. Let me pray to Raka'a. And after you finished praying, you walked over to the child. After he finished praying, he went over to the child and he poked the child in his stomach and he asked him, this is a child in the cradle, newborn baby. He asked the child, who is your father? And the child spoke in the cradle and said, my father is the sheep herder such and such. So they went over to Juraj and they began to apologize and kiss him on his forehead. And they said to Juraj and Shitta, so min that if you want, we'll rebuild your monastery back out of gold. Now how sorry he felt for what he did to him. And Juraj said, no, just build it out of dirt and clay as it was the first time. I don't want anything from you. I'll get my haq yom al from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point that I'm making here is so many lessons in this story that we don't even have enough time for two khutwas to go through the many lessons that are in the story. The fact of the matter is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to get you out of any situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with something and he used the salat as his makhraj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلَّهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِرْ that whoever fears Allah, Allah will make a way out of every difficulty for you. And will provide for you in ways in which you can never imagine. But you have to believe that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the hadith of Qudsi, Ana inda dhani abdibi, that I am as my servant thinks I am. And I can do for my servant what he believes I can do for him. If your faith is weak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never help you. Allah will only assist you based upon what you believe He can do for you. We're people of little faith. We're people of very little faith. We got all of the outside of Islam down packed. But when it comes to those intimate moments where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us in our lives, testing us in our faith, testing us in our religion, testing us in all of these different aspects, these intimate moments in our lives, we prove how much we really believe. Brothers and sisters, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana 
وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى وعفاف والهنا اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من سخطك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك ولو حرصنا أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة